All right. Um, well, on behalf of the Nakata Board of Directors Council and Executive Office, I'd like to welcome everyone to this, the third in our series of Nakata Virtual Town Halls for 2019. Uh, my name is Carrick and Cannon. I'm the director of the University Exploratory Studies Program at Oregon State University, and I'm also a member of the Board of Directors. Um, I'm joined today by several amazing colleagues, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves to you now in the order that you see them on the slide. So we're going to start with my fellow moderators and then move on to the panelists. Uh, Megumi? Hello, everyone. My name is Megumi Makino Kanehiro, and I'm the director of the Manoa Advising Center at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and also a member of the board. Happy Friday, everybody. My name is Michael Brody Brochiers. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Academic Success at the University of Southern Indiana. I'll be help, helping Carrie and Megumi moderate today, and I'm also on the board. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Arshambo. I am the Vice President for Enrollment Management and Student Success at Rowan, Rowan College of Burlington County in New Jersey. I'm a member of the Board of Directors and currently serving as your president. Hello, Erin Justina. Uh, I'm the director for the Center for Transponders Undergraduate Experiences at Texas Tech University. Um, also currently board member and um, presently vice uh, president. And hello, I'm Cecilia Oivadas at the University of Missouri in Columbia. I am currently a board member and incoming vice president uh, for Nakata. And hi everyone, I'm Wendy Troxel with the Nakata Center for Research and um, I've been serving in a support role to the, to the board on this project. Excellent. Thank you all. And you're going to hear from all of those folks as we go along here. So uh, what you're seeing on the screen right now is our agenda for today. Uh, as we do with all our town halls, we try to make a connection of our topic to our strategic goals. And then we'll provide you with some rationale and outcome for outcomes for this session. Uh, there's going to be a brief panel presentation, and then uh, we're going to open things up for Q and A and comments from uh, our attendees. Um, to, so to that end, I'd like to mention a few details and logistics for the event. Uh, we have an event page that outlines our series. And that includes uh, recordings of the town halls that have already happened. And it's also going to house a recording of this event as well. Um, you're going to see a URL for that page on the screen. And that was also sent to you for the uh, with the invitation for this event. Um, our mechanism for engagement during this event with you all is the Q&A function. You're going to see that at the bottom of your Zoom window platform there and at any point during the presentation you are most welcome to send a question or a comment um, after the panel presentation is when we're going to engage with those questions and comments at that point. Um, I also want to note that on the event page there uh, is a link to a Google form. Uh, it's a place where you can provide additional feedback, comments, questions that you might have about the event. So if you happen to be watching this at a later date, there's still, uh, still a mechanism for you to provide feedback for us uh, at that time. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to hand this off to Megumi. Thank you, Kerry. One of the board's primary responsibilities is to be sure that the Nakata strategic goals are being met. Today, our main focus is, of course, strategic goal number four, foster inclusive practices within the association that respect the principle of equity and the diversity of advising professionals across the vast array of intersections of identity. However, our virtual town hall today also connects to goals number two, provide professional development opportunities that are responsive to the needs of advisors and advising administrators. Number five, develop and sustain effective association leadership. And number six, evid, um, engage in ongoing assessment of all facets of the association. We have three major learning outcomes for today's session. First, you will hear updates that focus on the board's work in the area of inclusivity and diversity. Second, you will hear the next steps that are being envisioned. Finally, as always, the virtual town halls are a chance for you to pose questions and share your comments and suggestions with us. I will now hand it off to Karen to introduce the panelists for today's session. Hi, everyone. So uh, I'd like you to, to join me one more time in welcoming Erin, Cecilia, and Wendy to our panel today. 
The entire board has been actively involved in uh, the investigation and the, the evaluation of the association's uh, approach to diversity and inclusion over the past several years, um, but especially as we're coming into providing some feedback and some outcomes from our discussion, we wanted to make sure that your current leadership, as well as Wendy, who's provided us so much uh, support from a research perspective, are present and, and able to give you some uh, some feedback as well as be present to answer your questions. Um, the inclusion and diversity investigation that we've been undergoing isn't really new to the association. Um, the association's strategic goals, while they do uh, get updated every several years and they get reviewed, they are far from being brand new when they come to the work of the board. So inclusion and diversity have been part of NACADA for, I would say, forever. Um, however, just about a year ago, we started to dive a little bit more deeply into whether or not we were fulfilling our promise of inclusion and diversity, especially with regard to the feedback we had received about individual members and their experiences, and whether they really had as deep of a connection to the association and as fulfilling of a relationship with the association as we wanted them to have. So the board, uh, just about a year ago, um, approved an engagement with an external consultant to try to determine whether or not we were meeting those goals and to what extent, really, we were meeting those goals. Our hope was that through this engagement, we would be able to uh, get more feedback from everyone within the membership to get extensive and deep feedback from the membership um, and also to determine what the next steps might be for the board to take so that we weren't feeling like we were um, doing the same work over and over again with inclusion and diversity but that the association and the board were continuing to progress and advance that work especially as um, that work becomes increasingly important as our membership becomes increasingly large and increasingly diverse. So with that said about what we, what we knew and the background that we had, I'm going to hand it over to Wendy to give some information about the research study itself and both the strengths and challenges that that provided us with. Thanks, Karen. Um, so yeah, I'd like to just really briefly share uh, an overview of the process that the board went through to kind of vet uh, the report that we got from the external consultant. So a subcommittee, kind of a research analysis subcommittee um, of uh, Oscar von den Weinhardt and Brett McFarland and I um, took a really close look at not only the report, the final report, but also the raw data um, that was provided by the external consultant. Um, and any external assessment like this, or any good research project for that matter, uh, once data are collected through methods like interviews, focus groups, surveys, it's important to consider um, procedural issues and response issues like response rates, representativeness of the participants that responded, and um, that analysis is usually a function of the design itself, the relevance of the instruments and the methodological procedures, including the timing uh, of all of this. Um, so what we discovered and talked about, it had to do with kind of an interesting construct. Uh, I, I, I've been thinking about a quote that I've, I've heard, I don't know the author, I'm sorry, but the quote is, from the outside looking in, you can't understand it. And from the inside looking out, you can't explain it. So the the, the review from the external um, evaluator, MYB, was really helpful as an outside, unbiased source, which is typical of external evaluators. Uh, but we felt that some items of, in the instruments didn't appropriately capture the structure and complexity of Nakata. Uh, you might have felt that too as you took the survey, for example. But what it did do was to provide external eyes on a very complex and important issue. And the board and council are taking this very seriously. What it didn't do, in our opinion, was reflect the complexity not only of this professional association, but also critical inequities uh, structurally in higher education and society overall. But Back to the report itself, which is really the, the, the piece that, that they're focused on the most. With any evidence-based report, it's wise to try to map the evidence to the findings, the conclusions, and the recommendations. And what we found in that was we had a very low response rate, 
We had uneven representativeness across the Nakata membership, and that caused us real concern with the statistical significance uh, of the findings. Um, but that said, the board and council has found great practical significance with the framework, and they're working really diligently to unpack it all. Uh, also, they're gathering lots of other evidence, data and artifacts from the great work over the last years of the Inclusion and Engagement Committee, Professional Development Committee, uh, many related advising communities, um, ongoing feedback from these town halls and face-to-face -face town halls, relevant items from the ongoing region review project that um, some of you are involved in, and of course, one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, with members and interested others. Um, so from my perspective, the board and council are serving you and the association incredibly well on these really critically sensitive and important issues. Um, so I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, at the end about methodological issues uh, if needed. But at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Cecilia, who will get more deeply into um, the, the, the things that the, the board are working on specifically. Thanks. Thanks, Wendy, for that overview of the NYBE report process and as, um, as well as the information about the things that we've been doing in Nakata uh, across different facets of collecting information previously and what we're continuing to do. With that said, uh, as we considered the collection of data, evidence, voices uh, from our membership and from the report in other areas, we as a board and council identified some next steps that we'd like to start moving forward um, as we continue to work towards uh, strategic goal number four to foster our inclusive practices that respect, again, the principle of equity and the diversity of our association. Uh, so the first set here, um, we've got the prioritization of of the Nakata membership experience to ensure that those who um, need and want assistance know where to go and how to seek that and that they're also supported in doing so. And we're looking for ways that we can do that both collectively and for individual members. Uh, we also really want to in, ensure that we're creating regular, consistent, and safe spaces for the courageous conversations um, around race and ethnicity and other diversity issues. That was definitely something that has risen um, uh, to the top in many of the conversations and a lot of what we gathered and what we saw in the NYB report as well. And that said, uh, within those, we want to ensure that the voices are heard and acknowledged through, throughout the association, not just in those safe spaces, but hopefully um, in the other spaces that we're creating um, around in the association, um, but also in the field. Um, and also, we really want to directly address the different and divergent elements of diversity in a way that doesn't try so hard to include everyone that it loses its meaning. I think that's really critical that we can't do all things at all time at all times, um, but we really want to be intentional in the conversations that we're having. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Erin to talk more about uh, some more of the interest areas that we have. Thanks, Cecilia. Yeah, so in addition to the things that Cecilia has just mentioned, um, the board's also going to be really focusing on work both inside and outside the association to increase uh, pipelines of advisors of color. So while um, we've actually made really good improvement in our leadership, better uh, matching our overall membership in terms of ethnicity, gender, um, categories of um, region and all of those things, we wanna make sure that we ensure our membership more accurately mirrors the actual profession and even our community. Um, so going kind of beyond um, just getting equal numbers in leadership, but overall in the membership, how do we get more and more people into the membership? Um, we also want to determine how do we make paths to leadership as clear as possible uh, and ensure we have a consensus on the definition of what leadership is within the association. So how do, how is the, the word leadership being used and defined and how um, for those who want to go to the leadership path, um, how do we make it really clear um, and help them uh, figure out those paths? Um, in addition, we hope to determine how to scale the success of the Emerging Leaders Program and improving the diversity of our leaders. Um, obviously, this has been a program that has um, demonstrated over and over again its um, efficacy, I guess, at, at creating um, support for leaders. Um, but we also recognize that there are monetary limitations with that program, and there's always a need for 
you know, if you increase the number of leaders that are accepted, now you also need to increase the number of mentors. And sometimes that can be um, difficult to do um, within the association. Um, but we also need to consider other ways that we can sort of mimic the success of the ELP beyond that program itself. Um, so learn what we know from that program success and apply it in other ways. And finally, uh, we want to watch and learn from other associations and institutions to ensure our approaches to communication and inclusion are incorporating best practices. So while we feel really good about the association and the, the brilliance that's in these rooms, all of us are a part of institutions and associations, um, and we're never too good to learn from, from our colleagues around us. And so we just want to continually be open and, and learning um, to, to, to improve. So. Um, those are sort of the uh, outlined steps that we came to um, consensus on after our mid-year meetings, um, but of course we want to hear from you. So I'm going to hand it back over now to um, Brody, who will tell you kind of how to stay, stay involved in the conversation. Thank, thanks, Erin. Um, you've seen this slide up before uh, earlier in our session today, and I'll just reiterate what Carrie talked about. Uh, but you see that we've got recordings to our past uh, Nakata Town Hall events uh, here in 2019. And you'll also notice that we do have two additional events planned all the way up through the annual conference this year in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, and, and then the piece that I think is really important is just a reminder that you've got access to that Google form, that link. If, if your questions aren't answered today or we aren't able to get to your questions, uh, please make sure that you can you know and know that you can access that piece or if you were able to just listen on later after uh, the live viewing of the town hall today and you want to get a question answered that Google form uh, the URL that you now see on the screen is a great way to get there as it relates to our question and answer function today uh, you can see that at the bottom of the zoom platform that Q&A function you are able to type in your uh, questions there uh, we're happy to take those questions and at this point we're going to start uh, kind of the question and answer portion of our uh, session this afternoon. Uh, I, I do have a couple of questions here to start and I'll go ahead and get us started with the panel and the, the first question that's popped up here in our uh, in our platform is diversity and inclusion work is a process and sometimes it feels like the pace of the process is glacial. Can the panel speak to progress that the association has made in the last few decades with regards to this work? Who wants to take that? Well, I'll jump in on that one um, because as a, my background prior to being in advising and working with students directly um, was in history. And so I, I think a lot about the cycles of history and the way that things um, are often viewed as moving glacially, but they're often cyclical. Um, and I think that's a lot of what we, we look at with this particular topic, that um, the pace is never as fast as we want it to be, but it moves forward. And so when I look back at the, the history of the association, um, we're really looking back since the, the 80s. Um, and the, there was a perception or a reality that the leadership was not representing the diversity of the membership. And I think a lot of the work that's been done over the past few years has been in that, has been in that framework of um, our leadership is predominantly um, of a particular race, ethnicity, uh, institutional type, um, all of those characteristics that were the, the norm, I'll say, for leaders within the association. Um, and as the membership diversified, the leadership didn't. And so there was a lot of intentional work put into diversifying the leadership um, that included the work of uh, the diversity committee that arose by way um, of a task force and would eventually become the inclusion and engagement committee um, with several rewrites to the mission of that key group uh, to reflect the need for an expanded view of diversity and inclusion. Um, and then moving toward um, the, uh, the uh, Emerging Leaders Program and the real focus of that group on leaders as, uh, as they had not been represented in terms of the um, 
in, in terms of the leadership in, in prior years. And when we look at the, the growth of leaders coming out of that program, it is exponential. So I think when we look in those pockets, we see significant growth and it's not glacial at all. But when we look at it as an association, I think we're seeing those cycles and how, how challenging it is to move forward. Um, and also to some extent that we're representative of our society as a whole. And our society has moved glacially when it comes to questions of diversity and inclusion. And in some ways, we are um, we we are along that same path. So I'll, with that, I'll I'll leave it for someone else in the panel to jump in. I think Carrie would like to chime in here, so we'll let Carrie do that now. Go ahead, Carrie. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Karen was saying. I think um, one of the things that I've been impressed with the last few years, particularly on the task force that worked on the core values and the, and the group uh, professional development committee that worked on the core competencies, Terry Farr and her folks. Uh, it feels like this was a, a concern uh, going into that, that part of the reason why we, we wanted to address those values is maybe they didn't, when they were last um, taken on, they didn't necessarily do so through the lens of, of diversity and inclusion. And it felt like a lot of the conversations that I was in around those values um, brought that up as, as a point and, and made sure that the, the new iteration spoke to that. And I, I certainly think that's the case with the core competencies document as well. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, another, another question that I, that, I wanna, uh, that I wanna propose through the uh, question and answer uh, Zoom platform is uh, this. All, all NACADA members bring their lived experiences with them to the association. NACADA cannot cure all societal ills, but in what ways do the panel members think that the association can work to mitigate the inherent inequities that play out in a lot of institutions and organizations and empower members to speak out when they encounter such experiences within their interactions within the association? Who, who would like to take that? To start. I can speak to just a couple of things that come to mind just quickly. Um, so I think it's obviously we can um, have these kind of tough conversations and model that as something that people can survive, right? So um, really get in and have these um, safe spaces and have these courageous conversations and, and talk to one another. Um, I think that's one thing that we um, that we can do. I also know that there's work being done. Um, that kind of improves inclusivity overall and things like conference presentations, um, you know, there's conversations around how do we create trainings or presentations that help people know how to, to better put in a proposal that's more inclusive or, or how do we interact in rooms uh, or in, in, on a stage or whatever in ways that are inclusive to all members. So I think those kinds of things have been very powerful. I know that I think it, the inclusion, inclusion engagement, the Global Initiative Committee, um, I think PDC, Professional Development Committee, is actually involved in those types of things as well. So um, putting out some sort of, um, you know, information pieces and trainings that help people even recognize when they're possibly committing a microaggression or, you know, how do you, what to do if you are the recipient of some sort of comment that feels like a microaggression or a macroaggression even. Um, so I think those are positive things that I've seen um, recently. Does anybody else want to grab a hold of that one? Maybe. Um, I think I just, I think I just add that um, one of the, the, bullet points um, that Cecilia had mentioned earlier was about safe space and uh, safe space for courageous conversations. And I think what we've seen over the past few years is that um, the open town halls at the annual conferences have been incredibly uh, courageous, have been incredibly honest. Um, and people have been, I, I'll say people have been, uh, have honored us with their willingness to talk about their experiences within the association. And I, I think that it's our responsibility as a board and as an association to make sure that those, uh, those spaces aren't just available at the annual conference, but that they are available throughout. Um, that, they're, that we are all as board members available for individual folks to come forward and say, here's what I experienced and it wasn't good. Um, and I, I think that they're, that this board is um, incredibly willing to hear those comments. And um, I, I think that 
we need to be we need to make sure that that message of our willingness to hear it is is heard more globally. That's great, Erin. Anything? Yeah, just, Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So I, I just uh, was reminded of a, a thing that we also spoke about that it, as soon as I started talking, it left my mind. But also, there's um, been a lot of conversation um, happening around um, deficient uh, perspectives and things like conference uh, proposal titles and um, abstracts and publications, making sure that we're you know not using um, terms um, at risk. Um, anything that's like a deficiency model, right? So these are the kind of things that I, Karen says this a lot, you know, we don't know better. When we know better, we do better. And so it's the, all of these things are in that same sort of spirit, I think, you know, we come with what we know and what we've been taught and some of us um, don't have an awareness around those types of things until somebody brings it to our attention. And so I think the association, the committees and the um, even just um, members who come up and say, look, I think we should, you know, help people understand this, you know, can we, create a training around these types of things. And so I just wanted to point out that the, the language um, item as well. Thanks, Erin, I think that's a great point. We have a question from an anonymous attendee that I'm gonna ask right now. I believe that the association's done a good job in providing narrative on what it is doing. Could each panel member provide an example of something the association can do to move this work forward in a real and meaningful way? And I like that question. I can start on this one because I actually had printed off some of our notes and so it's right here in front of me luckily I've, I've got a, an edge. Um, so at, at our mid-year meetings we all sort of took on different um, aspects of the, the, the inclusivity study and we got into groups and talked about you know what if we're just kind of thinking about things we could do right things that are easy to do things that are harder to do. Um, one that I uh, think is something that would really um, be impactful is to um, when we put out, say, information about conference, to do an entire communication piece to, to the membership about as, all aspects of um, inclusivity. So, you know, accessibility and sessions that relate to social justice and, and diversity, um, where the gender neutral bathrooms are. So everything that has to do with sort of accessibility, inclusivity in a, in a very structured, you know, we recognize that these are all things that people um, are, are, you know, nervous about or concerned about, and or or and or just want to come and contribute to these conversations and putting it all in one place so that people aren't having to speak it out in in, in a number of different ways. So that's just one thing that I would say that came out that I think would be really easy to do and really um, impactful. I'll add um, the one of the things that we um, we need to to figure out how to balance is our desire for things to look good with our desire for things to be accessible. And what I mean by that is that um, often we, we look for, um, whether it's websites or it's print materials or it's uh, emails going out, um, to, to look really beautiful. And um, we sometimes forget that those beautiful things are not always accessible. Um, so I think that a, a mindful eye toward accessibility for visual impairment um, on materials that go out with regard to conferences, events, and those kinds of things is certainly something that we've started to take baby steps toward, um, but that is increasingly um, part of what we should be doing. And, and I, I just would add too, right, in, in terms of some of the practical ideas, when we've looked at barriers to leadership, right, as that was a subcommittee that I worked on with folks from across, uh, across the association uh, in my role on the board. And, and I think giving folks more access to leaders, right, one-on-one -on -one at events or through, um, through the website is something that uh, to me is really important, right? We, we've talked about being able to hear voices and being able to provide um, guidance as it relates to, man, to maneuvering and, and kind of getting through the association in, in positive and meaningful ways. And I just think, I think that that's a piece that's uh, sometimes missing. We, we don't automatic, I mean, I think we would all say that we're accessible, but we have to find systematic ways to do that too. I want to add, um, this kind of bridges the question of what's been done previously, but what more can we do? Um, so one of the things that I did previously um, over a couple different annual conferences was uh, 
conference session on uh, women thriving, uh, not just surviving. And so on this past annual conference, uh, we actually had a panel of um, diverse women in, uh, in the association, both leadership within the association, but also on their individual campuses, um, very well attended. But it goes back to having those safe spaces um, for uh, individuals to share um, and see other leaders, other members of the association um, who are similar to them or, you know, we have commonalities, um, but also to create the conversation uh, and be, to be able to ask those difficult questions of what's happening within the association, um, those things that, we, um, that we've account encountered as barriers, both within the association but also on our individual campuses uh, as we are intending to grow and develop within the within our um, our own personal professional development on our campuses but also within the association and so those are seemingly kind of half organic right half sort of driven um, by both the needs um, but also recognizing that those are critical issues um, and they are real issues that we are facing and so how do we take those types of conversations and create space um, intentionally, but also support the, uh, again, the organic development of those conversations so that those of us with those common interests, common concerns, um, common frustrations can have those conversations and support each other uh, through that, both within the association and as colleagues and friends outside of it. So I would like us to continue to create those spaces here, um, and, and that's part of uh, building our network within, within Nakata. Thanks, Cecilia. I had you covered by the questions. I didn't see that you'd unmuted. I apologize. Uh, this next question is from Tony, uh, and he says, when we look at uh, diversity and inclusion, we certainly have the important role to look diversity and inclusion with respect to race, ethnicity, gender, and sexual orientation. Have we given any additional considerations of diversity and inclusion within the broader regards to where our members come from, such as a lower proportion of people from, say, community colleges, tribal colleges, small private schools, or potentially increasing the number of advisors or administrators who are beyond their first five years in the advising profession. Erin, I think you said you were gonna to try to take a stab at that here to get going. Yes, thanks. So actually I think the, the, the work that Karen talked about earlier on the, the diversity statement and the, the diversity committee and now the inclusion and engagement committee has, has looked at that a lot. Um, the, the definition as it stands for Nakata is very broad. Um, and so the, all the work that happens, um, say like the Emerging Leader Program, for example, those are all categories that are considered. Um, when you look at their graphics, they're showing all of those categories that you mentioned there. Um, in addition, I know that um, the Professional Development Committee's work is, is looking at all those things. You know, where are the gaps um, for how we're providing, you know, beyond just conferences and, and in-person events, how are we providing um, leadership opportunities, um, professional development, resources to um, not just four-year public um, traditional role advisors type things. And so I think I, I think I would say that, that that is always in the back of everyone's um, mind in, in all of the work that we're doing in Nakata. Anybody else would like to respond to that? Um, I will, I'll add something. I believe uh, the membership uh, committee has been working on some ambassador type programs or ideas, concepts uh, that we can do some outreach to, to folks on those specific uh, types of campuses that are underrepresented either locally or regionally. Um, so I'd have to, we have probably have to follow up and, and get some more information back to the group as well. We can do a follow up. Um, I think Karen, we probably can incorporate some of this in as a follow up as to what that group has been doing, but I know that's definitely been discussed um, of how we can do outreach um, within our states and regionally um, to really engage uh, tribal colleges, for example, HBCUs that may not have um, the representation within Nakata uh, that we would like to see and, um, you know, have a mutual, mutually beneficial relationship uh, so that we can continue to grow and also support the needs of those um, advisors and, and higher ed administrators on those campuses. Um, panelists, we had a, we've had a couple of questions come in that I think are really uh, appropriate for us to talk about and address here that that relate to the idea of representation, um, particularly 
uh, questions about sort of the current makeup of the board and, and council and leadership with regards to people of color, particularly African American members, and also about just the representation on the panel today and some of the decision making that went into like who's presenting here and, and who's not presenting here and, and, and in what ways, um, you know, we incorporate, um, we incorporate all the voices of the board and the council and the leadership and, and the organization when it comes to our, our thinking and, and our consideration. So any, anyone want to address that? So I'll, I'll take a, um, a first step at it. And then certainly if my, my colleagues want to join in, you're, you're certainly welcome to. Um, I think first of all, I'd like to start by saying um, the board recognized and um, knew the, the visual that you all are seeing on your screens right now and that this is a predominantly, um, not exclusively, but predominantly white panel that's in front of you. Um, and we recognize that that is symbolic and emblematic of um, some of the challenges that we face. However, um, we also thought that that's ours to own and that we need to, to own the fact that we are a predominantly white board and not be afraid of having that, uh, having this conversation um, and not make the assumption that we had to defer to, um, to someone else rather than own this um, and own this as an, as an organizational problem. I am happy to report, um, as many of you may already know, that of the three newly elected board members, um, two are uh, women of color, both African American women. Um, and I, I think that that's, we're starting to see um, some of the, the changes in the past two years we, of six elected positions, uh, four have been women of color. Um, and I think that that is uh, symptomatic in a good way of the changes that the association has been making. Um, but as your president and vice president, Aaron and I both felt that we have to own the problems of the association. Problems might be the wrong word, but the challenges of the association and the results of the study that we as members of the board brought forward. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we were here, that we were um, speaking to these challenges, and that we are um, making it clear that we are interested in hearing from those who are impacted by this much more um, than we are personally. We recognize the privilege that we hold, um, both as members of the board and also walking around in the skin that we do, and uh, wanted to make sure that we are as open and honest about our willingness to listen as we possibly could. And can I just add to that, oh, that, that, you know, leadership in Nakata, of course, the, the visual is, is gonna be who's in these rooms and who's on this stage, but I just do wanna recognize too that many of our elections um, showed improvement um, in the diversity of candidates who ran uh, and were elected. So beyond just the board and council, which is, you know, sometimes seen as like a hierarchical group, but in a lot of the leadership, we saw, um, I think, some positive um, signs that, that this work is, you know, again, slow, um, cyclical, uh, society-wide, um, but improving. Yeah, I, the, the last thing I'll add, right, is we're, we're having events like today, right? And we're, we're continuing to have those discussions. It's clear uh, that they're important, I think, to the board. Uh, it's clear that we, we've tried to uh, continue to have these discussions if we feel like we're not, we're not there yet, right? We, we, have to, we have to have these discussions open, openly and honestly uh, and finding different ways to do that, whether it's virtual town halls, the, the events that we've had um, at the annual conference and regional conferences, I, I think that the, the conversation has to continue, right? And so to me, that, that's the other big piece. Uh, let's let's kind of let's kind of move deeper as it relates to this question, because I think there's another great question from an attendee that says, any ideas right now about how Nakata will achieve redistributive justice within the organization? Um, an equal redistribution of power across members from marginalized or underrepresented communities in the governance and administration of Nakata instead of just representational justice. 
leaders of color that might be overseeing the system that doesn't undergo holistic change? I like that question. I think it gets at a, a deeper issue within the topics that we've just discussed. Does anybody want to take that? That's deep. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's a great question. I, I mean, on the spot, I don't know that any of us have ideas right off. I think this is where we need to dig a little bit deeper collectively. Um, and we need to hear the voices a little bit more. I would love to hear from that particular person what what ideas they are considering as well. I mean, I think we've thrown around a lot of ideas, um, a lot of possibilities, but um, it's not just the voices of the nine of us who are on the board. Um, obviously, there are a lot of other leaders and a lot of other members um, who go into that. So I, I try not to kind of uh, not answer the question, um, but I think on the spot, that that's a hard one to answer in terms of all the different possibilities um, of how that of what that could look like. Uh, I know, just to give some historical context, the board used to be something like, what, 75 members? Um, and that gets a little bit unwieldy. And so, you know, when uh, the leadership structure changed um, a while back, I think that's something for us to consider of what does, you know, what does leadership look like um, in terms of the governance of NACADA, the administration of NACADA. And those are those are different pieces too. Um, there is the executive office side of things and then there is the member driven leadership um, of the association. And so I think we do have to dig a little bit deeper because it's a complex issue um, or com complex um, challenge that we have to look at um, from multiple different angles. So I know I'm, I'm really not answering the question, but it's giving me a lot of food for thought and I'm guessing that's probably true of the rest of the panel too. I'll, 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 sorry, Carrie. I'll, I'll try to I'll try to muddle through this. I think too, because to me, the one thing that I think is really important are the the practical steps that you take to improve an association. I think create the motivation for cultural change, right? So it's not automatically the other way around, right? I think action moves us moves us to motivation to be better than automatically wanting to be better moves us without action, right? So, so I, I think uh, when you start to think about the progress that an organization makes, uh, you, you have to look at the practical applications that, that provide more representation. You have to look at programming and services that, that hit at diversity and inclusion and creating a more engaged association overall. And then I think once you've done that, the culture changes, right? That at, at that point, we, we start to see a potentially a breakdown of some of that, th those power structures that, that uh, move beyond just representation. And so I don't know that I would answer, but my idea is we have to continue to act practically in the way that we think and hear from others uh, is gonna move this, this process forward. But at the end of the day, th that action I think is what creates the motivation to be a better association. And I also believe that we really need, I mean, we really need everyone's help. We need everyone to be involved. We need everyone to be at the table um, to have these concerns raised so that we can then work together. Um, I think earlier, you know, we were talking a lot about leadership, but there's also some great opportunities in terms of writing, publishing, research um, that really will help everyone to have a more, a, a more complete understanding, I guess, of all of the issues that that we need to be aware of um, as we improve as an association together as members. Carrie, you were going to add something. Yeah, I just really appreciate that question. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, it, it's, it makes me think again about um, the, the sort of the threads that make up the fabric of the organization, right? From the, the, the programming to the, um, to the, again, the values and the strategic goals and, and, and kind of want to echo what Megumi was saying about the value of maybe looking for other spaces that we can gather input where we can maybe um, interrogate and dig into like these these foundational concerns of the organization and say is this is this really looking is this really concerned with sort of the redistribution of power and and the type of inclusion that uh, 
we're, we're aspiring to. So I'm grateful for that question. It feels like we need to, we, we're going to put a pin in that one and, and wrestle with it a little bit as a board. You're muted, bud. <laughs> oh, I thought I clicked. Sorry. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to go to a, a question that came a little bit earlier, but uh, with regards to the bullet pointed list of board interests that were listed there, how are you using existing Nakata structures, the inclusion and engagement committee, certain advising communities focused on these issues to help operationalize efforts? Well, I think the um Part of the conversation at our mid-year meeting that resulted in uh, that list of, of items um, really was around the fact that we know that a ton of work is going on in different areas of the association. And I think it does sort of key in to the last question um, with regard to what is essentially a hierarchical structure. And so the, the question of how do we tie together the pieces of really good work that are happening in all of those different areas. So for example, the ELP advisory board is working incredibly hard on implementing the ELP program, but how does the association empower that board to consider what scaling up might look like and how they might connect with other parts of the association in order to do so, even if it's not at the full scale of the ELP program for every person who's interested. Similarly, the um, Inclusion and Engagement Committee does incredible work and has incredible work with, with research and data um, that they've been doing. So we need to make sure that they are connected to the broader, uh, the broader goals. And I think just in, in sort of that, that question about the, the structure and the organization, sort of um, it is an incredibly difficult question of how do you um, – how do you break through a power structure in order to, to see really significant um, redistributive change? Um, and I think the reality is that all of those changes are happening in, uh, in not intentional silos, but there are, there are some default silos that happen. And so it's the need for the association to move us forward by in some ways bringing good work together rather than necessarily reinventing the wheel. Anybody else want to hit that one? I just wanted to maybe add into a, a, a comment slash question that came in that, that CJ provided that I think aligns with this a bit. And, and um, you know, I'll, I'll, read the, I'll read the comment and the question because I think it's well phrased. Uh, I think that part of the struggle has been that there is this intense focus on practical action-oriented steps without a clear commitment to a practical uh, particular values of social justice and equity in ways that that are aspirational and normative there is little in the way of vision for a just organization for example acpa has engaged in a wide-ranging long years-long effort in their strategic imperative for decolonization and racial racial justice that was created collaboratively but sets the bar bar high for both vision and action is this is something like this being considered with nakata I wonder if anyone want, wants to chime in on that. It might be good for someone with a historical uh, kind of perspective there. Somebody who's been- I feel like, I feel like you're asking me to talk. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think that, um, first of all, you're right. Um, and I think when, you know, when, as this association has grown, it's come from a very different place than ACPA or uh, NASPA. Um, ACPA and NASPA both uh, came from a, from a broader ranging foundation going across um, multiple different areas of, of, uh, of student care that often are fed by and feed into uh, questions of social justice in a way that very frequently the academic side of the house has not been asked to do. Um, I think when we're looking at Nakata, there's certainly there's a, um, a new social justice um, advising community that is developing, but I think that almost speaks to your concern that it becomes a siloed area 
rather than something that is organization wide. Um, I think when we look at the institu- the organization as a whole coming out of this, um, I think that what you're pointing to in terms of organization wide uh, vision and action, um, that's exactly what we're looking at as our next steps is what what do we not only do better, but how do we frame this better now that we know more? Um, and I think that's the that's the piece that we need to to focus on. How do we how do we keep from continuing to be in those silo impact, which are all incredibly important, but don't get to that systemic change that you and the and the prior um, commenter both point to. I realize I'm probably I, it probably sounds like I'm talking around the the question, and in some ways maybe I am. Um, but really, that we recognize there's more work that has to be done, and I think that the bullet point pointing to us needing to look at other organizations, other associations for some help in this area is, is absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. The, this work doesn't stop. I mean, I think that's what Karen is really trying to say. And uh, if we've been slow to it, right, we, we certainly have to own that. But from my perspective, I think now moving forward, uh, the board and the association is committed to, to, uh, trying to get it right and to do the best that we can as an association. So uh, that's the only other piece that I would add to this uh, as it relates to, to, to CJ's point, which I think is, is valuable, no, no doubt. Uh, here's here's a, another, uh, another question. Uh, conference presentations are an obvious space to give voices to issues of diversity and inclusion. But often at the annual conference, maybe even the regional conferences, my perception is that sessions focus on the experience of advisors, students of color, and or historically marginalized populations tend to be programmed against each other in the same slot or the same time periods. Why is that? Does anybody want to take that? Yeah, I I can jump in on that one if you don't mind. Um, Actually, that came up um, at the annual conference in Phoenix at the, I think the last session or one of the last, the days um, had two or three really compelling presentations and and people were like, I wanted to go to all three of them. Why are they all at the same time? So we actually went back and looked at the entire conference program and tried to identify um, those sessions that addressed issues of inclusion, diversity, underrepresented groups, marginalized um, populations, and found that there were there there were sessions in in virtually every slot um, throughout the conference. And Farah and her team work incredibly hard um, to try to to jigsaw all the um, kind of competing important topics together. Um, and so, you know, the good news was, the, the bad news was that there were multiple sessions against each other. The good news was that there were multiple sessions across the entire uh, conference. And so um, that, that is a, a, a challenging, wonderful um, um, thing to, to have. It would be sad if we only had one for every session, that it should be uh, all over the place. And so, you, you know, that's something that's looked at in the in program planning, in, in schedule planning, um, and is always a, a, a wonderful challenge. Uh, so sometimes the perception is a little different than if you dig a little deeper in that. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, this comes from an anonymous attendee, and I think is is also speaks to uh, some of the things that we've been talking about re- uh, with regards to representation, but uh, and and leadership. Many Nakata members are unclear how to begin their path to leadership. The Nakata website highlights the various divisions, council, board of directors. However, the paths to become elected or appointed to those roles is unclear. This lack of transparency, with when coupled with a visual representation of Nakata leadership makes one assume that Nakata leadership is not for them. Can you speak to what the association is doing to dispel this myth? I can tackle part of that. And I think, Erin, you might be able to kind of hand or take 
where I start um, as to what the council has been doing most recently, but I know um, at least within the administrative division, um, which is our committees and advisory boards on each of those sites, um, websites specifically, there are um, there's information on how to get involved uh, specifically with each of those committees and advisory boards. Um, in addition, I think part of what we need to continue to do is um, be a little bit more clear in terms of sort of what the expectations are, who might be a best fit um, for some of these committees and advisory boards in terms of what experiences individuals may bring to help, um, you know, really uh, make some of the conversations in these committee advisory boards, for example, on the, at least in the, within the administrative division, when we're talking about things like finance um, and technology needs, publications within the association, that type of stuff. Um, and so we are definitely working on that. Um, you know, as we're identifying that, there are um, pieces that go into each of those in terms of uh, what, um, what makes a good leader, right? Um, and what specifically are the pathways in um, to each of those particular committees and advisory boards. But I know that um, council across the board, um, sorry, council in general is also looking at um, some things as it relates, correct, uh, Aaron, with, uh, with the leadership pathways. Right, so one of the things we, you know, just sort of a few of us started doing as we entered and exited some of these roles was had conversations about, well, I wish I had known that before I had into that role. Um, so we're, you know, we're starting to have these conversations and, and we've started to create some documents. The, the one that we're working on right now is like stepping into the role of counsel. So what does that role look like? Um, what is the work that you do when you're on that, um, in that role? You know, what do you have to have done to be there? Um, and you know that'll all go again on the website as well so i would say there's probably a great deal of information in the last few years that's been improved on the website to try to make these things clearer so again if you all you know have comments or suggestions that you can send in via that the, the link that you've got or you know call somebody or email somebody uh, we, we need to figure out ways to make that material on the web more accessible more live and think you know ways to maybe humanize a, a static um, screen. So we're welcome to welcome your thoughts on that. Yeah, we, we've had somebody on the Q&A function say, uh, you know, Wanda Reyes-Dawes, who's, who's on the Inclusion and Engagement Committee, saying, you know, that they are working diligently on those issues right now, the issues that we've kind of talked about here the last 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, Michelle Ware, who's uh, chairing that committee, is an incoming board member as well. And so I think we're going to start to see some of those things. I want to thank everybody for their questions. There are some questions that we didn't get to today. They started to come in fast and furious. I think I want to let panelists uh, as well as participants know that if we didn't get to your answer here in the live virtual town hall, we're going to try to type in an answer or respond to your questions, um, as well as if you still uh, want to, to chime in using the Google form, you should be able to do this. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Kerry and let him close us out. But I want to thank the panelists for their uh, contributions and thank participants for their questions. And I definitely want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, this has uh, been an excellent um, conversation and really got at a lot of the, the discussion points that we were hoping we would get to. So uh, I want to echo Brody's um, comment there that we got more questions and, and comments than we were able to get to in our hour with you today. And so we're committed to um, providing some sort of summative document that will will house on the event webpage along with the, the video of this event. Um, you know, I hope, uh, hope you'll, once that gets posted, you'll share it with colleagues and encourage them to wa uh, watch because we do rely on the members to give input and feedback and, and thoughts on these things. I know just speaking directly to one of the last comments there about inclusion and engagement, I, I know that uh, Michelle and Wanda and the folks who were on there would, would welcome thoughts and feedbacks about, about representation and about sort of redistribution of power within the organization. I think those are important things for us to discuss. So thanks for being willing to join us today. We appreciate you all so much and, uh, and uh, feel blessed to be able to have this conversation with you. So everyone have a great day. Thanks to our panelists, executive office and, and be well.